<gasps> if you're trying to write a series or saga, okay, or maybe you're trying to expand your novel into a series of saga, this uh, this third step in the process is going to take your story to the expanded level. That's right. Okay, today's uh, thing is about uh, structuring your epic story, dividing a grand narrative into a compelling series, part thrace. So in structuring your epic story, you have to remember uh, what today is all about. It's about dividing and dissecting your overreaching narrative into individual compelling stories for each installment. Ex we're going to explore the potential for companion books and ensure a cohesive narrative through lines. I don't know what that means. Let me re <laughs> let me re nah, nah. Basically, what we're going to do today is if you've been watching the last two videos, video one, we did a main plot line. Uh, and then in uh, the second video, we did we added some subplots. Today, we're going to actually show you how to break up the main plot and create a series out of it or a saga or break up the plot points uh, ultimately into extended stories. So why is that important? Well, it allows you to take a single idea and to get a little bit more out of it. Maybe you're interested in, I don't know, delving a little deeper into the elements of the story, but you know that you have a word count that you have to stick to, and you can't really put a lot more effort into the narrative than that's there. Uh, this process will ultimately show you how to take the macro and micro it up by spreading it out and saying, let's put a little bit of more focus on this. Let's let's explore that and let's explore this. I will also show you basically how to know if that particular element is even worth exploring and uh, give you a little bit of uh, insight into that. So the great expansion is all part of the process, right? And we're going to I'm going to show you how you can take either act 1, 2 and 3 and turn those acts each into their own novel, how you can take each section and turn it into a novel or how you can take each plot point and turn it into a novel. We'll also talk about taking characters and creating companions. Oh, nice. But before we get into that, I like to give three tips uh, on the process. And then uh, we kind of dive into it with a walkthrough. All right. So first uh, tip is uh, cut up the original concept into three into their own novels. Your original narrative plot, uh, your original narrative that you plotted out through the 27 plot points based on uh, the first video of this series. Your goal here is to try and figure out how much of the micro story you want to tell. For example. If you want three novels and feel like that will be enough to tell the narrative you want to tell, then break up the three acts. If you think the second act should be broken up into two novels, well then, that's going to turn into a four novel series. If you really want to tell the sections as their own novels, now you're looking at nine novels for your series. Now, of course... If you're ambitious, you can take each plot point themselves and turn each plot point into a narrative exploration. Me personally, my saga that I am currently working on is going to be a three series. Okay, it's going to be uh, it's going to have three series in it, and each series is going to be broken up into five books. That means my saga is going to be fifteen books long, and it's going to have three series in it the first series will be from the main protagonist uh devious maureen uh the second series will be from uh emperor maven's perspective so we get to see the antagonist through the same time phase and then the third book is actually considered a sequel of that original five book series and it will be uh the conclusion of the maven wars all right now with that said we're going to walk through that process in a little bit. So, number two, expand the series beyond its narrative. Now, keep in mind that a series has sequels. However, a saga might be made up of several series uh, within the saga and also some companion books. This is how you can expand beyond a series and its narrative. 
How about you have a character you really love and want to tell a story within? You say, you know, I really like Bill, and Bill sounds like somebody I want to go into. So, well, remember, you are the writer. You can do that. You can create a story solely based on your life before, even during the main saga, or maybe after a series if they live. <laughs> um, or you could be like me, where you just kill everyone off so you don't have to write another book. <laughs> I'm only doing one. No, just kidding. Um, these are things to consider when working on your main series and saga and how you're going to spread characters and story throughout. Why? Because you want to make sure that the companion book of that ca character makes sense in the grander picture of it all. Obviously, if a character dies in a series or saga, you don't want to give them a novel that takes place afterwards. But you could do a novel based on their family or a character not related to them, finding history on that character that opens up the world a bit more. The idea is to think about how you can expand the series beyond its personal narrative and build on that world. So what I'm saying is, even if you base the process on the first video in this series and you write out a single narrative that based on this video you'll be able to break up into different novels different series or even a massive saga you still have the freedom to go oh i could tell stories outside of this too i could create companion books um for me there are several characters within the main saga uh, that's sort of like come and go within the story. And I have books that I'm working on that are telling those stories of where they went after they left the main plot or the main storyline, um, you know, before they return, which they do eventually, or, or some of them do. <laughs> um, but I also have stories that tell the past the history of a character that's in the main saga or is referenced to in the saga so there's a lot of options <clears throat> i need some drinkage oh yeah next you want to number three find the narrative through line what does that even mean tom well, i'm gonna tell you Finding the narrative through line is about seeing the narrative through each potential novel and then the overall connecting narrative of the whole saga. Basically, if each novel is going to be an act, then each novel should still have its own narrative through line, but ultimately add to the overall through line of three novels. This is why the first video in this series talks about just creating one large narrative and then breaking that narrative up and then spreading it out and going deeper into the micro of it. Because now you know over the course of the books, even if you do just three acts as three separate books, or you do the, uh, the sections, right, the nine sections, and that's nine books, they still will make a compelling overall narrative uh, because it has a beginning, a middle, and an end within those nine books, but each book themselves will have their own full beginning, middle, and end, which will uh, be uh, spread through the 27 plot points as well. Now, this is something that you will naturally come out as you're working on the main plot over the 27 plot points of the original idea before splitting your narrative into other novels. You want to always make sure that even in the small chunks of the main narrative that you are doing justice to the this part of your story should be told with a micro exploration and this part of the micro narrative helps build on the macro of the main narrative through the series of sagas. So that that's really a, t a telltale sign is is this helping is if I go into the micro world of this story point this story plot point Will I be able to explore it in a way that enhances the macro of the main story? Before we go into the walkthrough, if you haven't done so already and you like what you've been listening to, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. So let's do it. Organizing the original outline into smaller narratives. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Okay. So, uh, we'll take me off so you can see better. If you already seen the first video and the second video, you know that I have mapped out a full 27 plot points. I'm just scanning over. Okay. 
right? And I did an epilogue and I did a prologue, okay? Now, real quick, before I get into the depth uh, uh, of looking at it, okay? Let's, let's talk about how we can break it down first, okay? When we talked about it, I said you could break Act 1 into its own book, okay? All right, which would be all this, all right? And then you could break down Act 2, and then ultimately Act 3, and that would be three novels. So in this noir that we have been working on, that means the first book would start with Jack, uh, a, a, a cynical private detective haunted by his past, uh, navigates the grim streets of the city, right? And then the book would end with driven by a mix of professional obligation and personal interests in Elizabeth, Jack resolves to unearth Michael's secrets despite the risks. Okay? So what that means is, if you take Act 1, the first plot point in the new expanded 27 plot point outline would be ultimately the Jack is a cynical private investigator, detective, I mean. And then the 27 plot point would be driven by a mix of per professional obligation and personal interest in Elizabeth. So the ninth plot point actually becomes the 27th. And now your job is to add all of the story plot point beats within there, right? But if we look at this, we still have these other, right? We have plot two, three, four, five, six, okay, seven and eight all of these plot points okay have to be explored okay so that means your first book is going to try to take these nine these nine plot points of act one and spread them out through the 27 plot point outline it's going to now take it out and you're going to let things breathe a little bit and that would be the same as if we did act two like act two, that means plot point 10 is now the first plot point. And the the book technically would end on plot point 18. And all this would be spread out within that novel. And again, the same thing happens with uh, act three. Uh, plot point 19 would be the first plot point now of the new novel. Okay. And plot point 27 would be the last plot point, and we'd actually add these. These would become the epilogue to the third novel. Now, for uh, schnizzles and giggles, we can look at it a different way. Let's say section one becomes the novel. We, we want to tell this story. So section one, The Ordinary World, that means we get three plot points. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that if we wrote this book... The first plot point would still be Jack is a cynical private detective. Uh, plot point three would be uh, ja uh, Jack delves in. Ignore the subplots right now. Jack uh, delves into the case. He uncovers layers of the seat, drawing him deeper into a web of crime. And then this would be the midpoint conflict. Now, looking at this particular story, that might not necessarily feel uh, right. OK, because do we want to end the story on Jack diving into the cases that might not make narrative sense? Just as if we decided to make a novel based on plot point one, Jack, a cynical private detective haunted by his past, navigates the grim cities of the street, taking on cases that often lead him into the heart of its corrupt city. Now, however, however, you can look at that plot point and say, can I tell the story that leads to Jack becoming a cynical private detective uh, and having him be having him explore the city and realizing that it is a corrupt soul? And then book two would be when Elizabeth comes into the story. And now we what you can explore is Elizabeth's journey uh, and the character, the, the person who comes in that we learn later is Elizabeth's father. The character comes in and hires Jack. So now we get to explore the, the character that comes in. Eventually we get to explore Elizabeth and we get to explore Jack being hired. And that story would ultimately be about, uh, 
well, it would lead up to Jack being hired. It'd be Jack being hired, like the exploration of that and who Elizabeth is. That might not be that interesting of a story. And these are the things that give you foresight to say, <clears throat> is this the right place to break it up? That's why breaking up an act uh, into a book is, is a, is a really strong way to do it because each act should have a beginning, a middle and end, which they do. They have section one, two, and three, which means that plot point five would be the midpoint conflict, right? So like breaking up an act naturally turns into a, a stretched out 27 plot point beat. And then you could kind of explore like the, the elements in between. For me, what I ended up doing actually is the first act of my long narrative <clears throat> I was like, you know what? I'm going to go up to plot point 14, which is the midpoint conflict, right? And I was like, I'll make that my first book. And then I'll make this from plot point 15 all the way to the end, uh, the second book, right? As I, because there's another step to this process, as I was working on the chapters, I realized that would have been a huge, a huge two books because of the depth of my story. And what ended up working out was I said to myself, well, why don't I stay with act one? Now this is where it gets interesting because you have to use your writer brain to figure these things out. While I worked on the chapters that developed the chapters, because you know, again, I, I map out my chapters too. I was learning that maybe I was a little, a little too deep, right? So what I ended up doing was, this plot point one to plot point five became my first book. And then plot point six to plot point nine became my second book. All right. Now, what did I do after that? Well, in my mind, I says, well, these will be two smaller books for the epic fantasy. About 250 to 1,000 words, um, which is much smaller than I then I was like, well, act two to, uh, or I should say plot point 10 to plot point 15, uh, 14 could now be the, the third book. And then plot point 15 to, um, to plot point 18 would be the fourth book. And then because act three was so quick and so right to the point, I made that its own book and therefore five books for the first series. Because the third act it usually is so quick. There's not a lot of world building and there's not a lot of like, let's dive into other things. But because it is its own book, I kind of can go a little deeper into that. I can explore those things, which is always fun. But anyway. So. Uh, so our goal here is to organize the original outline into small narratives. So what are we going to do for this example, for the noir example? We're actually going to just deal with act one okay all right so with that said all right with that said let's do it let's see what it looks like to do it which brings us to expanding the smaller narrative into a 27 plot point all right we're going to go over this more visually, but as you can see, I took the first nine plot points and I turned them into, I'm just going to scroll down, but we're going to go over it. This is the nine plot points spread out into its own new novel. Okay. This is a complete novel now based on the first act of the original narrative. At this point, I have three novels ready to be written in the series because I already have the through line. Now I got to work on the little beats. If I really wanted to, I could break it up even further and explore Charles' backstory or Tom's backstory and even Elizabeth's backstory. But the point is that you can follow a full thread originally and then pick it apart and go as macro or micro as you want. But in this case, uh, we're just going to expand the 27 plot points of the new thing so if if you look at it all right if you want to pause it here i'll take me off so you can look at it perfectly all right if you want to pause it i didn't add a uh, prologue yet but that's because whatever you could do that whenever 
Uh, so if you want to pause it, you could look at, all right, so how did I change it, right? What was the adjustment? Actually, what might help is this. Let me tell you, child. All right. Boop, 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 boop. All right, is that boom shalaka laka 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 boom shalaka? All right, as you can see. All right, boop, boop, boop. All right. Ba, 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 ba. now the first plot point in the original act one is Jack is a cynical private detective, which is right here. This is the original, this was the original plot one. Okay, so I'll, I'll original plot. Point one. Okay. And we'll we'll do this. We'll give it a nice big let's make it uh, boop a doop boop boop. No, wait, wait, we already have that color. Uh let's just do this. Alright. So this is the original plot point one. Okay. And then the original inciting incident was Jack is hired to investigate a seemingly simple case of blackmail involving Elizabeth. I did not want to use that as the inciting incident because I needed to spread out the nine plot points. So we're not there yet. Okay. Uh, I'll set that up there. I actually moved it to number six. Okay. Number six becomes the uh, the man who came to Jack in the case, and he ends up accepting it. So I changed the 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 flow of it a little bit to make sense. But that means I had to add one, two, three, four new plot points, new micro plot points. And basically, the inciting incident is that Jack is still approached, okay, about the case involving Elizabeth, but he doesn't take it now. It's just his approach, which puts him into a change of behavior, okay? And the protagonist reacts to it. Jack believes the case is going to be just another big headache and doesn't take it, all right? Which means, uh, I should write, he focuses uh, heavily on other cases that are straight to the point, okay? The fourth plot point... Um, by the way, we could ignore that, right? The fourth plot point is Jack is working a boring case sitting in his car while he watches two people walking in the park. It turns out that the woman is cheating on her husband with this guy. While sitting in his chair and taking photos of the couple, he thinks about the blackmail case involving Elizabeth. Now, I added a new thread to the original Anna subplot, The Shadow, and I actually seeded it. I give away her name, but the audience doesn't know it because they didn't read the story or see the story yet. So Jack reads an article by Anna, an investigator reporter, talking about how crime is controlling the city from the streets to the corporate offices of the city itself. So that's the seed that shadow exists in this world. But the audience knows her as Anna, and she's an investigative reporter working on a very specific story. Doesn't give anything away because it's just seeded. So it'll be a nice payoff when we find out that it is Anna, right? Okay. The fifth plot point I made, Jack ends up at the lounge where Elizabeth sings. He watches her perform while sitting in the back and reading over the information about her. Okay, so he's a little curious about it. He took a little action, right? <clears throat> Doesn't mean he took the case yet, though. And then I moved the moment where Tom is approached originally, uh... Tom Tom comes out in plot point four originally, uh, and it's well Jack is investigating CD bars, but we're not up to that yet. But I wanted to introduce Tom a little earlier. So while sitting in the lounge bar, which is still a bar, Jack runs into an old acquaintance, Tom, a former cop who was dismissed from the force due to corrupt charges. Tom, now a private security counsel, right? So we added that. We put it into a nice moment. Now, this would be the original inciting incident, okay? We expanded the first two plot points over six plot points, which is great. But we changed it slightly just to kind of fit the fuel of the narrative, which is Jack is approached outside the lounge as he gets in his car. It's the man who came to Jack with the case, asking him 
if this is his way of accepting the case. Jack takes the case and is officially hired to investigate a seemingly simple case of blackmail involving Elizabeth, a lounge singer with mysterious past. Okay. Now, the third original plot point, okay, was that Jack delves into the case. He uncovers layers of deceit, drawing him deeper into a web of crime. So, we added that here. Boop. This is the original third. So, I added a new plot point between that. Jack follows Elizabeth home, you know, because he does. That's who he is, right? Follows Elizabeth home. Okay. And uh, trailing her from a safe distance and parking near her house once she goes inside. But he notices that someone else is watching him. So he leaves the location and has to lose the person. Ooh. Which takes us to this. The first plot twist or pinch. As Jack delves into the case, he uncovers layers of deceit, drawing him deeper into a web of crime. that goes. Be so that's the original third. Now, I introduce the shadow also in the first plot twist pinch. So I'm actually doing a pinch and the plot twist. As Jack delves deeper into the blackmail case, he receives an anonymous, anonymous tip that leads him to crucial evidence. The tip comes from Shadow, an informant whose identity and motives are unclear. Jack is skeptical but intrigued by the accuracy. Okay. Now... The original plot point four was Jack's investigation leads him to seedy bars and back alleys where he encourages thugs uh, oh, encounters thugs and informants with cryptic messages. All right. So let's see where I put that. Mm -hmm. Right here. Boom. That becomes the new world. So this is the fourth. All right. So I added a plot point nine between those two. And this is where he goes back. So because of the twist and the plot point, uh, the protagonist is pushed into the new world, which means we have to have a plot point where uh, it's sort of like whatever happened with that twist, he has to be reflective to. He has to experience it. There's a consequence to it. And he goes back to his office to think about the case and realizes that one of the men that were mentioned, well, he learned that the web of crime goes beyond simple blackmail, will take him to bald head Bobby. Which now takes us into Act Two, the New World, and he's going to investigate, uh, which brings him to the back alleys where he encounter, encounters uh, thugs and informants. One of those is Ballhead Bobby. Now, as you can see, I added more elements. I uh, I built up on the information. This is what's important about the writer aspect: is even though I'm expanding, I get to go into the micro. It could have just been thugs, but now it's Ballhead Bobby, and we're adding to the world. <clears throat> okay. During the investigation, Jack seeks out information from Charlie. From Charlie! Now, originally, um, this subplot began in plot point five. Okay? But I also add a little element to Jack asks about the case he's on and if he knows Shadow is. If he doesn't. Okay? So, let's keep going. Now... Uh, we need to figure out what the original plot point five is so you could see what it originally was, right? So the original one was despite warnings to drop the case, Jack's sense of duty compels him to protect Elizabeth. So let's see. It's not this one. It's not this one. Jack accepts at lunch with Roger. It's not that one. Heading home. Okay. It's not that one. Okay. Jack wakes up in the hospital. Tom comes and visits. Boom. Boop. All right. So this is the original fifth. Now look how many new plot points I just microed the hell out of. All right. So this was the four. So plot point 10 is where the fourth original plot point is. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six. Six between them, and the seventh one now becomes the fifth. You see how fun that is? Okay, so we actually got to rebuild the second act. We got to play with that. And the way we looked at it is uh, he goes and meets Baldhead Bobby, but then Jack ends up at the precinct, okay, and he speaks with some friends there, asks them questions in passing without giving away that he's asking questions 
about his case. You see that? So we learn we learn a lot about him. We add a little bit more background to the Tom case, which wasn't in the original story, right? Okay, Tom is brought up by the fellow cops since they all know him, and the cops make fun of Tom for being a security consultant. One of them says something about the corruption charges that Tom was dismissed for. Jack mentions that he saw him the other day, and they asked if he was drunk. He was not drunk, okay? So that's showing a little bit of change and growth. Oh, just the position. So Jack goes back to his office, which we didn't really have him going back to his office a lot in the original, but now we get to explore his office. And while there, he drinks. He looks around his walls because he's thinking about Tom and the old days because of the precinct in plot point 11. All right. And he's looking at the wall at old photos from when he was younger. He sees a photo of him, Tom, and several other police who were at the precinct. There's one person who isn't in the photo but is now a big-time defensive contract guy who handles security for major corporations. Roger. Okay, which brings us to the build-up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Jack sets up lunch with Roger. Two old friends catching up, right? Roger tells Jack that if ever, if he ever wants a job, he's always welcome to work for him. Jack mentions that work is great. When asked what cases he's working on, Jack tells him about Elizabeth. Roger tells him that if he can help, let him know. Okay. Now we add some more elements to the subplots. This is the Tom one. Jack asks Tom about Roger, who handles security for the major corporations. Tom says that he used to work for Roger, but decided to go his own separate ways. It cost him a comfy position, but he's happier being a private security consultant. Pora but happier. Okay. Interesting. Uh, Jack receives another anonymous tip from shadow that leads him to uh, crucial evidence stating that he shouldn't trust the corporation that Roger works for. Oh, okay. Now we're getting into it. So this leads us to the main midpoint conflict heading back home. Jack notices the same car following him that had followed him some nights ago. They end up in a chase that leads to a gunfight. Jack crashes his car and two large men pull him out and beat him up. They tell him that Elizabeth isn't worth his time and that he's only alive right now because of a shared history. But that ends here. Oh, man. This would actually go here. So before that happens, Jack catches up with his buddy, Charlie. He asks him about some of the information he's gotten. And Charlie tells him he should go back to cheating wives and terrible husbands. And then while Jack is uh, heading home. Okay. You can do that. You don't have to. Sometimes, sometimes you want to make sure it's in the right order, you know, however you want. All right. The immediate consequences of that car chase is that Jack wakes up in the hospital. Woo. Okay. Standing there when he wakes up is Elizabeth. Oh, she's back. She tells him that she heard that he's investigating a case about her. He denies the allegations until the man who hired him shows up with a cup of coffee. The man tells Jack that Elizabeth is his daughter and that he needs to protect her and figure out why she's being blackmailed. Jack says that he can't even protect himself. The man increases the money and tells Jack that of all the people who could help, he's the one who was referred the most. Okay, which brings us to the consequence. Tom comes and visits Jack in the hospital. He helps Jack at home. They have a conversation about life at their age and the meaning of it all. All right. We get Charlie again. On their way back to Jack's place, they stop and get a drink at Charlie's bar. It's revealed that Charlie and Jack used to serve in the war together. They mention a range. uh, 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 They mention a ranch uh, they would stay at and hunt, mentioning that they should go back soon. Now I'm seeding that because that comes up later, the ranch. But also, look at all... This is what I mean. So the micro element is that now what was originally in that Charlie and them have a kind of a relationship in the original story, the original one book narrative. Uh, you know, there's some camaraderie. They uh, they laugh and tell some jokes. But now we're actually, we learned that uh, Roger was in the war with Charlie. We learned that Roger and Charlie used to go hunting a little bit more. We le- So we get to kind of explore characters and build on them a little bit. 
whereas in the original story, we might not have that kind of time, especially in a noir. You don't want your noir raising up to 150, 200, or even 250 to 300,000 words. You want it to stay down there. 81,000 words is a good size noir book, right? So that's why you get to say to yourself, do I want to expand this into a series? Is there more that I feel I can tell? And this is one of the ways you get to explore that and build on your story. Back to it. We're almost to act three. Now, this brings us to the original, whoops, the original uh, plot point, which was despite warnings to drop the case, Jack's sense of duty compels him. Okay. Because we, when he's talking about war and everything, he remembers his, his code of honor, his code of ta- conduct, and that things are important, et cetera, et cetera. And it's through Charlie that he remembers his valor, right? And then uh, after Jack becomes a target for the underworld, he reluctantly seeks Tom's help to navigate the dangerous landscapes. Tom's insights lead to Jack's crucial piece of evidence, which, by the way, this was originally in the main narrative but now we put it here but it's at the end of act two jack receives another anonymous tip from shadow that leads him to crucial evidence stating that he shouldn't trust the corporation that roger works with this clue suggests that jack is in danger because he's knocking on the first door of truth so it's reiterating and pushing the fact that something's up with roger which brings us to the last beat of act two. Oh wait wait so we have to figure out the sixth original plot point, which was Jack's interference angers the city's underworld, making him a target. His office is ransacked, which is this, right? Now, if you notice, some of the plot points are right next to each other based on this, and some of them aren't. And that's the power of being a writer. You have to make sense of it and whatever. So this is a setback, right? Right. And he decides he's going to keep going, which makes sense with this original OP plot point, which means we should talk about plot point seven. The original plot point seven was as Jack and Elizabeth grow closer, he learns of her involvement with a powerful businessman, Michael, who has dangerous connections, which uh, is right here. Let's put that there. And now we know we have one new plot point between that because we're in Act 3, the resolution. Okay, Jack and Tom take Elizabeth into their protection and head off away from the city. All right. Which brings us to this. You know, he learns that Elizabeth is uh, has learned about her involvement with the powerful businessman, Michael. Tom reveals a bit of his history, right? Uh, okay. Uh, in the case that got him dismissed and that he wasn't the only one, but it all fell on him. What do we learn? We learn that it's revealed that even Tom, even, oh, this is <clears throat> even though, even though Tom was involved, Roger was the mastermind and had Tom take the fall for it. That's why he gave him the job, but Tom didn't want to work for him once he realized uh, that he didn't want to owe Roger anything. So now it's getting a little cryptic here, right? Okay. Oh, now we got to figure out plot point eight, which was originally Elizabeth confesses that she possesses a secret that could incriminate Michael and put him in life for jail. So let's go down. Let's go down. Let's go down. Boom. Look how far that is. Great. Great. Okay. So that's one, two, three beats in between. So let's look at those. Plot point 21 People are outside the house they are staying at. Uh, oh, people are outside the house they are staying at away from the city. Tom points out that those people work for Roger. They fight to get out, out of there and end up killing one of the men while leaving in their car. The three of them head off and are on the run. So that's the darkest moment. <clears throat> They're being forced out of their way. Which brings us to having hit rock bomb. They are heading out of town. They are about three hours from the next state. Okay. All right. We get another subplot from the Chateau. Chateau calls Jack's cell phone. They use a voice modulator. In the call, they tell Jack that he can't leave, that they are able to track him somehow. When asked how Shadow knows this, they tell him they tell them to worry about what's coming and that soon. We will meet when the time is right. So now Jack knows leaving the city doesn't matter because they could track them. So 
In plot point 23, the protagonist decides they can do it. And Jack thinks about leading the men, tracking them to an isolated area and to figure out where to hide Elizabeth. Which turns into subplot two. As Jack navigates the corruption of the heart of the city, Shadow continues to provide valuable information. However, Jack notices a pattern. The tips often place him in risky situations, hinting at et cetera, et cetera. So this, this was in the original narrative. And this is the revelation from this. So once Jack, Jack is thinking about that now. So instead of it being something where like it's more of like a physical moment, it's more of a, a mental thought and it passes like that. All right. So we get to the original plot point eight. She confesses in doing so. Tom says that he'll take the fall and that Jack and Elizabeth should keep running. Take the bus. Jack says no, but Tom and Elizabeth need to get out of there and he will come find them once he takes care of something. So obviously, where's the last original piece? Right here. Oh, wait, wait. Driven by a mix of professionalism. Boop. There it is. That's the last plot point. Because it has to be. Because that's the end of the end. So let's look at this. How does it end? The last battle, Jack loads up all the hunting guns that are at the ranch and sets traps. Jack calls the police station where his he's friends with everyone. They are looking for him for the murder, the murder of the man he ended up killing in self-defense. Jack tells them where he is and that they'll oh, that he'll go quietly. The men show up and there is a fight that ends with Jack coming out of on the town. Oh, who work for Roger show up. OK. Also, Jack hides out at an old ranch, which we know this would go here. Okay. Which was seated, by the way, earlier. Now, the climax. Will he succeed or fail? Jack calls Roger and says that he knows that he's coming for him. Roger says that he's already there and honks the horn on his car. The horn is heard on the phone and close by. Roger tells him to come and get him. Uh, They end up having a fight, and Jack takes Roger down using his wit and traps. Jack ends up getting a lot of information from Roger before the police show up. He learns more about Michael, which takes us to the last plot point, the resolution. The police show up, and Jack plays the recording he did when interrogating Roger. He hands Roger over to them. And now the original plot point is driven by a mix of professional obligation and personal interest in Elizabeth. Jack resolves to unearth Michael's secret despite the risks so that we know where the next book is going. Right. And also after Jack is betrayed by his friend, Roger, he confronts shadow calling them up on the phone, demanding a meeting shadow agrees, which takes us to the epilogue, which is shadow eats, uh, enters a diner in that diner at a dimly lit diner reveals herself to be Anna, a journalist who has been, and that is in the original, uh, narrative. We seeded that all the way over here in subplot uh four and it pays off at the very end of the book and there you go that is act one spread out to 27 uh plot points it's a new novel it's the first part of a three novel series i'm so sorry i'm so sorry dry mouth okay that's the magic of writing but as you can see we took that if you go back to video one if you haven't seen it already we take that original 27 plot point narrative and we just take those nine plot points and now we get to explore them with all those other plot points right 18 18 18 new plot points anyway all right now take i want you to take this uh section uh this part this tool of the video and think about your narrative in segments I'm going through them you can start with uh the axe look at the axe and say is do i want to tell three novels to three stories do these acts make sense you could do what i did i took the original act up to the midpoint conflict and i said you know what i want to make that the story i thought my series was going to be two books um well, actually, technically, I thought it was going to be three books. I thought it was going to be the devious perspective, the maven perspective, and then the sequel. And then I realized those are huge stories. So then I focused on the devious one first, 
And I was like, I'll break it in half. And then I was like, that's still a pretty big book. So then I went to Acts and I was like, oof, Act One, Act One is still pretty big. Uh, so I broke it up. I, I actually broke that up, right? And uh, I, I cut the first act into two halves. And I was like, there's two books. Um, then I looked at the second act and I was like, this, this is pretty big too. So I broke the second act up into two books. And then the third book, I was like, this would be a pretty solid third book because it's not a lot of additional uh, growth, right? It's just like, let's, this is the resolution. This is the end of the series, right? So you can do that. So when you're practicing, work on creating 27 plot points through outlining exercises and then say, how do you break that up? If you're working on your own book, look at the acts, look beyond the acts, uh, <clears throat> you know, look at the plot points. Do you want to tell those stories? Do you want to tell segments? Do you want to do two segments for each novel? It's all up to you. You look at it and you see what works for you. The important thing to know is if you're going to take an act, the first and last plot points always stay the first and last plot points. The middle plot point should stay in the midpoint conflict somewhere within one of those three beats. Uh, if you take a segment, like a section, like section one, the ordinary world has the ordinary world, the inciting incident, and the protagonist reacts. Well, plot point one would be the beginning. Plot point two would be in the middle. It would be the midpoint. And plot point three would be the end. And then you have to fill in the spaces for that. Uh, so use that at your own discretion. Final thoughts. It's crucial to step back and behold the vast narrative landscape we've navigated together today. Expanding the story beyond its initial confines is akin to charting undiscovered territories where each subplot and character arc is a voyage into the unknown, revealing hidden depths and new horizons within your narrative universe. The art of dissecting and expanding your main narrative into individual stories for each book and potentially further into companion books is not just about extending the length of your saga. It's about deepening the emotional resonance, enriching the thematic layers, and broadening the scope of your world to create an immersive, multifaceted experience for your readers. Each subplot, each character's journey uh, weaves into the larger tapestry of your series, adding color, texture, and depth as you build on the subplots, the character arcs, and the main plot. As you continue on this path, remember that the true magic lies not in the quantity of the tales you tell, but in their quality and interconnectedness. Your saga is a living, breathing entity with each part contributing to the vitality of the whole. The care and thought you invest in expanding your narrative will pay dividends in the richness of the worlds you create and the depth of the characters who inhabit them. So as we part ways today, take with you the tools and insights from this lesson, but more importantly, carry forward the spirit of exploration and the courage to delve deeper into the heart of your narrative. The worlds you create are boundless, limited only by the reaches of your imagination. So continue to weave your stories with passion, care, and an eye for the intricate dance of subplots and character arcs. The epic series or saga you dream of is not just a possibility. It's a journey you've already begun. So, ultimately, may your writing journey be as epic as the stories you tell. Am I right? Next video in the series. Oh, organizing chapters. So what we're going to do in the next video is we're going to take uh, the outline that I just showed you today. And we're going to start breaking them down into chapters. We're going to look at each plot point and think to ourselves, how many chapters do we need for this plot point to unfold? Do we need one, two, three, four, or five? And even though it's going to change over the course of the next pro uh, next uh, steps to this process, it gives us a strong foundational starting point to look at the plot points in chapter form, knowing, all right, can we tell this within 3,000 words? <clears throat> That's our goal is like, we don't want to go more than 3000 words. However you can, <clears throat> uh, I'm just saying for this noir version, but you yourself, you, if you're writing epic fantasy, a chapter could be, you know, 16,000 words. I wouldn't recommend that for your first chapter, <laughs> but it is art. Okay. 
Question, if you could give any side character from your favorite book series their own spin-off story, who would it be and why? Okay, share your thoughts in the comments below and let's discuss how these characters can enrich the world. Am I right? Okay. If you haven't done so already and you're like, yeah, I kind of want to now because I'm, I'm digging this person. Uh, hit the bell, hit uh, subscribe and uh, hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. Quick reminder, if you if you haven't, keep in mind that I do try to do Saturday videos. Uh, you'll see the premiere dates on my homepage and also through random posts. I do live videos where I do things like this. I'll go over lessons, but in real time, I'll do real examples off the cuff. Zero prep. Zero prep. Anyway. As always, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. I love you.